Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the next webinar in our Breaking Down the Ivory Tower series. Um, today is quite a special one, it's to honour the International Day of People with Disabilities and today we're going to have Professor Maria Jose Diohenes talking to us about how her personal story changed her professional life. Before we start, I'm just going to quickly do some intro slides about Alba for anyone who might not know so much about their work. Okay, so the Alba Network was created to promote equity and diversity in the brain sciences. The goals of Alba are to recognize implicit bias and discrimination and to provide better visibility and professional development opportunities to scientists from underrepresented groups in brain research. The network now has more than 1,600 members from 89 countries and keeps on growing every day. And if you'd like to get involved or simply support the cause, then please become a member. It's free and easy to do. In order to carry out its mission, the ALBA network has organized a series of different activities based on four different pillars. These are awareness and advocacy. So for example, establishing a declaration on equity and inclusion, data and resources. So for example, creating a database of scientists as a resource for speaker invitations, prize nominations, et cetera. Visibility and recognition. For example, establishing awards to recognize outstanding contributions from underrepresented researchers. And lastly, network and mentoring, such as hosting workshops and networking events at major conferences. So a pillar of the ALBA Network's actions is the ALBA Declaration. And this is a resource for concrete, positive, evidence-based actions that individuals and organizations at any level can do to promote equity and inclusivity. Therefore, I would invite everyone attending here today to read the declaration and sign it. Then we have to mention who uh, closely works with us. So the ALBA network is proudly supported by several different societies and organizations, such as FENS, Elsevier, Society for Neuroscience, and more recently, the ECMP. So the webinar today is being hosted by the ALBA Disability and um, Accessibility Working Group. And our working group has the goals of increasing the visibility of neuroscientists with disabilities, raising awareness around disabilities in the workplace, and also encouraging best practices within institutions in order to foster inclusion and equal access to opportunities. Okay. Uh, as part of our group, we've also recently been releasing short videos which have quick tips on how to include uh, in increase inclusivity and accessibility in everyday work practice. So make sure you check some of these videos out. So today's webinar is part of our Breaking Down the Ivory series, uh, the Ivory Tower series. And this is where we've been trying to invite neuroscientists um, who have uh, different disabilities or work with people with disabilities in order to give these scientists a platform to promote their research and also talk about their own experiences of performing research in what can sometimes be not a very accessible work environment. So without further ado, we will start today's um, webinar. So now we are going over to Katerina, who is one of the co-chairs of our group, and she will introduce today's speaker. Thank you so much, Ray. So now we would like to welcome Maria José Diógenes. So Maria José Diógenes is a PharmD, Master in Neurosciences and PhD in Biomedical Sciences, Basic Neurosciences. In 2018, she obtained an aggregation in medicine, pharmacology from the Faculty of Medicine from the University of Lisbon, uh, where she is Associate Professor. And um, she uh, is also a researcher at the IMM, uh, so Instituto de Medicina Molecular Alumno Antunes, in Portuguese, uh, from Fa Faculty of Medicine, University of Lisbon. Um, so uh, she has a vast experience as investigator. She led several national and international funded projects, and uh, she has won two Santa Casa Mantero Boulard Awards. Um, 
and she um, also um, so has supervised several master and PhD uh, students so far. So Maria José is the president of uh, the Portuguese Society of Pharmacology, president of the Pedagogical Council of um, Faculty of Medicine from the University of Lisbon, and she's member of the executive committee of FR and member of the committee for the evaluation of medicines in Infarmed. So uh, let me say how pleased we are and honored to welcome you. I know we know that you are a very busy um, professional. So thank you so much for taking your time. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Katerina, about this presentation. Let me see if everything is working. So can you see my presentation? I think. Not yet, probably. We can see it. it looks great. No, but in my, uh, for me, it's not working. Okay, let me try again. It's not working. I don't know why. In ten minutes ago, everything was working. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Ah, hmm. just check the different um... everything is okay and is okay this will stop at okay this is not working can I do I have permission to share yes because we can see your slides but they are not uh, passing now they are okay mm -hmm. okay so so hello uh, i'm sorry about this this was a kind of technical problem i think you are let me see if i can do i can i can use my pointer Yes, now, now everything is okay. So first of all, of course, I would like to thank the invitation to be here today to talk to you. This is a huge responsibility, I may say. Uh, I, I don't know if what I'm about to share with you will inspire you uh, in any way, I hope yes. But really uh, what I would like to say is that I think all of us have personal challenges, and I think all of us can have a career in science. Um, I may say that uh, during the weekend, I was preparing this presentation, and I did, a, I did a deep reflection about my life. This is not usual. I may confess that uh, I was a little bit depressed, but in the end, uh, I may say that uh, I was very proud of myself, of what I've been done so far. And now I will share with you a little bit my, my story. Um, so this is who I am. Um, and Katerina already present me. But I am also other things, as all of you. I have lupus. I'm married to Enrique. I'm a mother of three daughters one of them with a rare disorder, a uh, disability, but I am also daughter, sister, friend, and we are a conjugation, all of us are a conjugation, a combination of everything. And in my opinion, I think it's inevitable that our personal lives affect our professional lives and vice versa. And now I will talk a little bit about my personal life. So when I was a teenager, uh, I began to suffer from severe joint pain along with a strong fatigue. And then I was diagnosed with this disorder, ankylosing spondylitis, and I started taking a lot of medicines, but the symptoms never went away. And um, in that time, this health condition was really um, very difficult to deal with, and it had a huge impact in my daily life and in my activities. Then I had my first daughter, and in this period, the symptoms aggravate, aggravated a lot, um, and the doctors realized that um, 
I had another disease, not ankylosing exponylitis, but rather lupus. And then I started taking the right medication, which helped me really a lot. So this health condition um, started to have less impact in my daily life, as you can see here. Then I had a second daughter. And with the second daughter, uh, everything changed. And I'm going to talk about, of course, how my lupus affected my work. But I think there is something in my life that affects me much more, which is the condition uh, of my daughter. And I had my second daughter, as I mentioned, um, and here everything changed. Uh, she started to show signs that some something was not uh, right. Uh, it was a real punch in the stomach uh, and my life was turned uh, upside down. Uh, she started to have seizures, um, stereotypical and movements, uh, developmental delay, and a genetic test um, revealed that she has Rett syndrome. This is a rare disorder uh, which mainly affects girls and is a genetic disorder. This is a devastating disorder. Later, uh, we realized that the genetic test was wrong uh, and the new diagnosis arised um, month, which is a developmental disorder as well, even rarer, rarer than Rett syndrome, but really difficult to deal with um, as well. But at that time, um, it was time to grow professionally and it was hard uh, and it is hard right now. Um, but staying at home, um, I think, is not the solution. Then I had my third daughter, uh, which is perfectly healthy as the first one. And during all of this happening in my life, um, the professional life was running, as you can see, and I was able to achieve many, many different uh, things, as Katarina already, um, already mentioned. Now I'm going to show you in a simplified way um, how the various events on my personal life have appeared and have affected my personal, my professional life. As I mentioned before, I was diagnosed with this ankylosant spondylitis, when I was around 24 years of age, I had pain, I had sleep deprivation, I had um, to go to many medical appointments, um, a strong fatigue, I, I had to do a lot of physiotherapy. Then I realized that I had a different disorder, but of course with the same symptoms. And this, is, this was really difficult to deal with because these... Um, these uh, implied physical difficulties in performing experiments, for instance. Uh, it was very difficult for me in that time by, to pipette, to dissect. It was really bad because I have to wait to the symptoms disappear to, to be able to do a proper experiment. And I had less time because I had to have a lot of medical appointments, physiotherapy, and one thing that many people doesn't talk about is the money. I spent a lot of money in medical appointments, in physiotherapy. So it was also a big deal to deal with. And we know that science is not stable uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of career. So this was something uh, that was concerning me a lot. So after the birthday of my, the, after my second um, child, um, when we realized that um, she was um, affected by this disorder, um, everything uh, was really uh, even uh, worse. And this man syndrome is a rare disorder where children have cognitive impairment, refractory epilepsy, motor impairment, stereotype and movements, change in behavior, for instance, and it was really bad and it is difficult right now. So um, it requires therapies, uh, several medical appointments. Of course, here 
I passed to a severe sleep deprivation, stream fatigue, frequent hospitalizations. Um, I passed almost a year in the hospital. I had to adapt to this complex situation. We took turns sleeping in the hospital, me and my husband. I wrote papers there. I revised theses there. I prepared classes there. It was really difficult in that time when uh, she uh, had a very difficult epilepsy to manage. But now she's uh, more stable. And this implied very little time for myself, again, less money, and uh, I no longer have a proper time to rest because I have, I have no time to work properly and I don't have any time to do uh, something different from working and taking care of my daughter and taking care of myself a little bit. And about less money. Because of this, I accepted to work as a pharmacokinetic expert in Infarmed, which is our national agency that regulates medicines and health products. And I'm very happy to do this work right now. But this also affected my time. So um, I was able to do all of this that you are seeing here with a lot of struggles, of course. But I think I was lucky. Uh, because I shared my struggles, uh, my director, colleagues, students understand my difficulties and help. And I have an amazing family and, and an amazing husband. And what I would like to say is that I think we do not have to do everything alone. I think we must be honest. We, we should share our difficulties and ask for help. I think this is very, very, very important. And now um, I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about science, what I did during these periods. Um, and I will start by the PhD and uh, master and the beginning of my um, research career. So I started by studying um, I, started, I started by studying strategies to potentiate BDNF synaptic effects in physiological conditions. Maybe I think all of you knows what is BDNF. I will uh, explain in a few slides. Um, I published, I think this was the first the paper that it was really important uh, for my, my scientific career. This was my first paper published in Journal of Neuroscience, where I found that the activation of A2A receptors facilitates brain-derived neurotrophic factor modulation of synaptic transmission in hypocampal slices. And when I started to have my own group, my own research group, I changed a little bit my focus. And my focus is to study strategies to potentiate BDNF effects, but in pathological conditions, and in namely in Alzheimer's disease. So I started by studying ways to potentiate BDNF in Alzheimer's disease. And now I am going to talk about what I did here, and I will show you um, some of the data I obtained recently. But first, I would like to say that after the, the after I had my I have had my second daughter, who was diagnosed with uh, red syndrome, I started to, to study a lot of about about red syndrome, because I had nothing to offer to my daughter. There is no treatment for this disorder, so I started to 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 read papers. I started to study this pathology. And it, I realized that in this pathology, there is an impairment on BDNF actions. And this was really a surprise for me. And I was not able to close my eyes about this, to this. And I started to, to study uh, red syndrome as well. And this was really important for me. It, it was a kind of therapy. And it was really, really, really a change. Now let's talk a little bit more about science. So I think all of you know what are neurotrophins. So neurotrophins are a group of neurotrophic factors. Neurotrophins include nerve growth factor, the first neurotrophin to be discovered by Rita Levi Montalcini, NT3, NT45, and the BDNF, probably the most known neurotrophin discovered by Yves Allenbach. And this BDNF 
works by the activation of this uh, transmembrane, transmembrane receptor, track B full end receptor. Once activated, this receptor triggers several different pathways, which culminates with different actions, such as survival, synaptic plasticity, uh, axonal and dendritic growth, and differentiation. And I think it's easy to understand that when there is a dysfunction in neurotrophins, there is a synaptic atrophy, synaptic dysfunction, and cellular death. And indeed, we already know that BDNF signaling dysfunction is present in many, many disorders, in neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease, in neurodevelopmental disorders, such as Rett syndrome, in neuropsychiatric disorders, such as anxiety or depression. And there are a lot of people around the world trying to um, reverse these dysfunction in, de in different um, disorders, but only looking to the levels of BDNF. And let's see what happens in Alzheimer's disease. In Alzheimer's disease, there is a decrease on BDNF levels. And of course, if there is a decrease on BDNF levels, we will have an impairment on these pathways. And because of that, a lot of people thought that BDNF could be probably a good drug because BDNF has pro-survival effects, BDNF uh, can, uh, can regulate synaptic activity and is involved in the pathophysiology of the disease. But there is more about this. We have decreased levels of BDNF, yes, it's true, but we also have decreased levels of TREC-B full end receptors and increased levels of these receptors, these truncated receptors, we are, we, we, which are dominant negative receptors that regulate TREC-B full end receptors. So in our group, we started to understand why this happened, why TREC-B full end receptors were decreased and why TREC-B truncated receptors were increased. And we did a lot of experiments, and we found, I think, something very interesting. So in physiological conditions, uh, when uh, BDNF uh, activates track B full end receptors, there is a signaling transaction system and a lot of cascades are activated. But in Alzheimer's disease, when you have huge amounts of amyloid beta peptide, uh, there is a huge activation of extracellular and MDA receptors which triggers the, the, the increase of intercellular calcium. And this calcium can activate calpins and calpins cleave the receptor, cleave track B full end receptor. That's why we have less amount of track B full end receptors in Alzheimer's patients. And this cleavage gives rise to two different fragments, track B T, a new truncated form, and an intercellular domain that we named track B ICD. We did a lot of experiments. Uh, we observed that this cleavage implies a BDNF signaling impairment. When expressed, overexpressed this ICD in healthy animals, they show impaired recognition memory. This ICD also affects gene expression and we can detect it, it in extracellular vesicles. This track ICD also goes to the nucleus and alter the phosphorylation of axonal and nuclear proteins. And, and what about real humans? We were able to study some samples, CSF from 80 patients and known 80 patients and postmortem brain tissue from 80 patients. And look what we observed. We observed that in CSF from 80 patients, there is an increase on the, this ICD, this intracellular domain in Alzheimer's disease patient, patients, showing that indeed this occurs uh, in patients and not only in animal models. And then we were able to study several um, samples from uh, AD patients, and we, we, we evaluate levels of track B full end receptors and track B ICD. And of course, as expected, we observed the decrease on track B full end receptors in uh, later stages of the disease and in increased of the track B ICD levels again in the later stages of the, 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 the disease. So we started to think about to design a novel agent specifically to prevent track B full end cleavage. 
And we did a lot of versions of a peptide. We designed several peptides composed by the sequence spanning the cleavage site of track B flan receptor fused to a TAT protein transduction domain, um, working as a decoy. We designed several peptides. Unfortunately, most of them uh, didn't work. Uh, but we did not give up. And finally, we uh, came out with a, with a peptide that worked, that, um, that decreased the cleavage of track B and receptor. And this is our peptide, our new compound. We did a lot of experiments. We, sh we, we, we studied biophysical properties of this uh, peptide. Um, this peptide can translocate the BBB, the brain barrier, um, we observe this in a simple model of a BBB. It does not disturb membrane fluidity or integrity, and it enters the nucle and it enters neurons. So this was really an achievement, I think. Of course, we proved that this track, track this this TAT track B, this this new compound, decreases the levels of ICD. So as you can see here. In, in, in um, control conditions, we have considerable amount of track B and receptors. When we activate calpanes by calcium and calpanes, we um, completely digest track B and receptors. But when we add that track B in a specific concentration, we were able to restore the levels of track B and receptors and decrease the levels of track B ICD. More, we were able to see that indeed this TAT track B restores the action of BDNF in the release of glutamate. So here you can see that BDNF increases the release of glutamate in the presence of amyloid beta peptide. BDNF is no longer able to increase the, re the release of glutamate, but again, in the presence of TAT, BDNF again is able to uh, to release to induce the release of glutamate, and in LTP magnitude, TAT track B prevents this decrease on the LTP magnitude induced by amyloid beta peptide, as you can see. We did a pilot study in vivo, um, and we observe um, also positive uh, things. So we used uh, five fat animals. And in those animals treated, this, this, the, five, the five fat animals treated with, IC, with that track B, our compound, we observe a, a huge difference in the learning curve. So all the curves are superimposed, but not the one uh, which is related to the animals not treated with that track B. So showing that indeed uh, the that track B avoids this learning curve impairment. Of course, we then quantify track B full end receptors in ICD, and we observe a decrease on this ratio, showing that indeed there is a decrease on track B full end receptors. So putting everything in a nutshell, because this is a lot of data and I don't have time to go through everything, so I would like to say that we did some uh, in vitro biophysical, um, we study bio, uh, in vitro biophysical properties. So TAT track B translocates the BBB and it does not disturb membrane fluidity and integrity. Um, TAT track B decreases the ratio of track, track B ICD and track B full end. So it avoids the cleavage, at least partially. Um, we did some ex vivo uh, experiments to evaluate the efficacy of this compound, and we observed that this TAT track B restores the action of BDNF on the release of glutamate and prevents the decrease of LTP magnitude observed in the presence of amyloid beta peptide. And in vivo, we observed that TAT track B prevents the learning curve impairment in the animal model of Alzheimer's disease and, presenters, um, and prevents the cleavage of track B full end in the brain. So we have a patent um, uh, about this, this peptide, and we are right now trying to find some financial support to continue this work. We published several papers. These are some of them, papers related to this work. But my work is not Alzheimer's disease only, it's also Red syndrome. And Red syndrome is a rare neurodevelopmental disorder, um, which is caused by mutations in MECP2 gene, uh, which is present in X chromosome. Uh, and mainly girls are affected by this disorder. So as I mentioned before, this is really a very uh, tough disorder. As you can see, uh, girls um, have a normal or an apparent normal development until around one year and a half. 
and then they started to to show different symptoms developmental retardation uh, rapid regression loss of hand skills motor abnormalities seizures and a lot of different symptoms including anxiety uh, this is really a, a difficult disease uh, there was no treatment until last year uh, there is now a treatment but it only uh, decreases several uh, symptoms and uh, not so good as we could uh, as we would like to um what about BDNF deregulation uh, in rat? We know that in rat syndrome, there is a decrease on BDNF expression levels. We know that BDNF knockout mice present similar symptoms as uh, MECP2 knockout mice. And we also knew that genetic overexpression of BDNF can ameliorate some of the functional deficits in MECP2 knockout mice. And really, we think that abnormal expression of BDNF um, can be a possible uh, cause for the neurological dysfunction in RET. Um, a lot of people have been trying uh, to potentiate BDNF levels in RET syndrome um, with different kinds of strategies and approaches by increasing the levels of BDNF endogenously or by uh, giving exogenous BDNF, but using alternative routes of administration because BDNF cannot cross the BBB. Um, People have been trying to activate directly track B full end receptors, facilitating the effects of um, mediated by BDNF track B full end. But the truth is that we don't have any strategy right now using BDNF or promoting the increase of uh, levels of BDNF to treat or to help red patients. And I think we uh, the mechanisms underlying um, BDNF signaling dysfunction are not the same in each disease. That's why I think some of these studies have been failing because people look to these uh, alterations as similar as other um, disorders. So I think that approaches to potentiate the effects of BDNF must be carefully studied on one case by case um, uh, study. Um, and it was exactly what we did. Um, we started to think about um, eight-way receptors and why. Because during my uh, PhD, um, I found that the activation of eight-way receptors are really, really important for BDNF actions. And we know that the activation of BDNF receptors is important for track full and receptor to go to a specific domain of the membranes, um, the lipid rafts, where uh, it is possible to activate the, 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 the signaling transduction uh, cascades. Uh, Eight-way receptors are important to maintain BDNF levels to phosphorylate track B full end receptors to maintain track B full end uh, receptors levels and is important to many, many, many other things mediated by BDNF. So we started to think about whether um, in red syndrome, uh, this uh, adenosinergic signaling um, would be altered or not. So we started to think about, we started to, to, to study uh, the neurologic system alongside uh, with BDNF signaling. So we confirm what others already um, had observed uh, previously. In RET syndrome, there is a decrease on BDNF levels, but also a decrease on track B full end receptors. And of course, uh, BDNF has um, impaired actions in many, many different ways, uh, in particular in on LTP, the long-term potentiation, with the, which is the basic um, mechanism that explain learning and memory. And what about uh, adenosine? We found out that adenosine levels are decreased as well, and a receptors are decreased as well. And this is really, this was really an achievement, I think, for us, because if we have this decrease, of course, this will imply an impairment on BDNF signaling. Um, then we did a lot of experiments. Um, we uh, observed that the in vivo administration of an ADK inhibitor, which increases at the nosinergic levels, recovered the BDNF loss of function on LTP. Um, as well as the activation uh, ex vivo of the eight way receptors. And just for you to, just an example of the experiments, these are um, electrophysiological experiments where we, we record LTP. In a normal condition, BDNF is able to potentiate LTP, but in RET syndrome, BDNF is no longer able to potentiate um, 
uh, LTP, but in the presence of SCH, which is um, uh, CGAS, which is an agonist of A2 receptors, we were able to uh, rescue uh, BDNF um, effects upon LTP. This are just examples to show you our work. So putting everything together in red syndrome, I think we found a new pharmacological target. Uh, we are investigating the impact on other, um, the impact of the impairment of the nosinergic system in other functions. And we are searching for novel therapies or strategies, pharmacological, genetic, um, and so on. And here we have some of the papers that we published uh, inside this specific topic. And I will almost, I'm always, uh, I'm almost finishing, but I have to say that recently uh, I started a new line of research. Again, um, my life, my personal life interfered a lot with this, um, with this um, inclusion. So we were studying ways to restore BDNF actions on Alzheimer's disease and Rett syndrome. But uh, my daughter started to have a very, very refractory epilepsy, very difficult. We had to start with ketogenic diet because epilepsy uh, did not respond to any of the drugs available in the market. And at the same time, um, there was this girl, do you know it? Dunor was working in epilepsy in the lab uh, with other researchers. And I think my story uh, contaminated uh, all the people in the lab. Uh, they were really concerned about my, my daughter and they were all trying to help me in a different way. And this girl started to, to study a lot, novel strategies to, um, to help people, to help, if, to help people with this refractory epilepsy. Um, and we discussed a lot, uh, several uh, options that he um, he was able to find. And because of this, and because we observed in our experiments that track B I C D can alter gene expression and can alter genes related to status epilepticus and epilepsy, I think this was kind of a trigger for us to start it, to think about other questions. Is the cleavage of track B full and receptor occurring in, in epilepsy? And what is the role of ICD in epilepsy? And so with these questions, we started a new project um, in collaboration with Sara Chapelli that I think it's present today in this seminar. And because of this, uh, now we have these three lines in our lab, um, we are studying Alzheimer's disease, red syndrome and epilepsy. I'm not thinking about to add more um, disorders. Now I'm going to deeply study these three. And I think these have been a, a very interesting way with, with difficulties, with challenges. But I think I was able to do this um, because um, both in my personal life, this is my daughters. These are my daughters, my husband. In my professional life, my friends, my colleagues, my uh, director, um, I think I have been lucky enough to meet fantastic people. And I think every challenges that we have in our lives can be um, overcome by collaboration, by asking for help, and by being honest with people around us. And I think that's it, my, my message for you today. And I think all of us can do whatever we want um, if we have proper support. We need the support in our lab. We need people to understand that sometimes we are not able to do something because we are in pain, because we are extremely uh, tired, because we are in sleep deprivation. And I think that is the, the point. We need to um, tell people that we are not okay um, and explain them why we are not okay. And I think with this, we will have the help we need. I hope, at least. And that's it. I will stop my presentation. I think I, I took too long. I think 40 minutes, right?
more than fine. Don't worry. <laughs> So, Marisa, thank you so much for this impressive story. <laughs> I think. Thank you. I, so I may say that it was a little bit emotional when I I was preparing this this um, presentation, because really the story, mainly my daughter's story, was really kind of um, contamination in the lab. All of the people were um, at that time in the beginning, uh, very. Um, I may say very emotional, very, well, I don't know, <laughs> but they helped a lot. They visit me at the hospital. They took me um, information that uh, I was needing at that time. Uh, it was really, really, really nice. Yeah, thank you, Maria. That was a really, really wonderful talk. The way that your personal life has influenced your professional life and obviously vice versa you can see it really clearly during the talk and it's yeah it was really emotional stuff so thank you for being so vulnerable with us it was yeah really inspiring um, I think it's exactly that we should be vulnerable mm -hmm. sometimes people think that if you are vulnerable you are you are going to show to people that you are not you are not strong but you are strong if you show your vulnerability I think yeah, definitely. I think it takes more strength to show vulnerability than to just hide. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, we have one question here, which says a uh, very inspiring talk. Thank you for sharing. What are the next steps to take the TAT peptide into human clinical trials? It seems very promising. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you for this question. So, yes, well, um, First of all, uh, we now are trying to understand the pharmacokinetic of this peptide because we only did a pilot study in vivo. So we choose uh, those uh, uh, without any pharmacokinetic knowledge. So now we are doing pharmacokinetic experiments uh, to know a little bit more about the peptide. Then we will repeat in vivo experiments in terms of efficacy and toxicity. And then let's hope for a company to, to support us and to take this project. I think that sounds very, very promising, yeah. Um, so another question we have is when you were going through the really tough time with your daughter having to be in hospital and you having to be there a lot of the time with your husband, how supported were you by your institution and your bosses during that time? Did you feel quite supported? And if not, is there anything that they could do better um, in future for such situations? No, I felt very much supportive. Um, my boss is really, really a special woman. Um, and she was really kind in that time. Uh, she never asked um for me to 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 have something done in a certain period um uh, it was really 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 nice yeah wonderful that's that's really good to hear because fortunately you don't always hear that story sometimes it's the other story yeah. you get <laughs> no. and I should say that my students I think they were really important and they are really important because I was out a lot of times without being being able to support them and they were really um, calm uh, and they understand and they understood very well my situation. So I think I should uh, thank my students because without them, I it these uh, never uh, have never been occurred. Yeah, yeah. I have another question from the, the chat. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for your inspiring talk. We keep listing that personal and professional life must be apart from each other, but you showed us that we can always find personal comfort in our professional career and that our career also helps us keep our personal life move forward. Thank you for being this amazing professor and for always showing us, your students, this vulnerable side of uh, yours that actually makes you stronger. So it was just a comment. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now I'm really emotional, I may say. 
It's true though, I, I wholeheartedly second that. And I think the more people in positions of power that can show that vulnerability and show that, you know, we're not machines working in research, we're actually humans with lives outside of the lab. The more people that can show that, the better because it paves the way for the next generation to be the same. Totally agree. I would like to ask you something about this vulnerability uh, because, well, um, from other side, we we people with disorders um, are are taught, at least it was my my case, uh, to show that we we can do. We are strong. We can do as much as others. So sometimes I just I just feel um, that it's hard to tell people how hard it is to be on my side, because I just I just always look like I'm fine. Exactly. Right? Exactly. What happens with the invisible disorder? So how do you how would you recommend uh, to overcome this? I, I'm going to say proud side, but it, it, this is not proud side. It's just like um, the sense that you you have to feel and you have to show others. You you have uh, you feel that need. I I think that you can do it, right? Yes. So you are absolutely right. I feel the same. So I think people are always expecting that you were able to do everything. Um, and um, I don't know how to overcome this and whether we should um, be telling all the time that we have a disability. I don't know. I really don't know. What I know um, is that um, when you are not, I think when you are not able to do something, to accomplish something, I think I think we should be honest, telling why. Um, that's it. Be honest. Okay. Thank you so much. And another thing that I would like to ask, since we don't have uh, um, more questions in the chat so far, at least, is that when you realize that your daughter had a disorder, did you forget about your own disease? A little bit, yes. But because it was much stronger, uh, this uh, impact in my life. Um, it's really, really difficult to deal with um, with the disorder of uh, a daughter or a son uh, because we cannot control it. And we are outside looking to that little um, human being suffering a lot and we cannot do nothing. And this is really, really difficult. And we have to provide a lot of uh, attention to that little um, human being all the time. Um, and yes, yeah, sometimes I forgot that um, I have a disorder as well. That's what I thought. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I think we have another question in the chat, um, which is, what advice would you have um, for young researchers who have obstacles with their health, so they have a disability or a health problem, and they feel that it affects the energy they can put into the beginning of their professional path? What advice would you have for them? Oh, my God. It's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult because people with this kind of disabilities have to work, I think, in my opinion, have to work much more and have to put much more effort in everything. So in my situation, I I, th I think, I, I don't know if this is a good option, but I gave up of my uh, time to do hobbies and other things. I gave up that time. So to, to have time to, um, to work uh, more than I should be working to overcome my, my disabilities. But I don't know if this is the right direction. I think it's very tough. Like you say, there's no one answer that fits all. So, for example, if you have a, a mental health difficulty, giving up your hobbies obviously would be a very exactly. bad idea for you. So, it, exactly. like you said, there's no one answer that fits everything, but, really. Yes, but I should say that in my difficult moment, when my daughter was diagnosed with Rett syndrome and started to have those um, that very difficult uh, epilepsy, I started to dance uh, in a group 
And that was really good because that was the only time I had to think about other things, about the routine we, we were preparing, for instance. And I remember that one time uh, my daughter was at the hospital and we had um, a presentation, a public presentation, a show. And I was not um, very comfortable uh, going uh, to the to the um, the show, the presentation. But I decided to go, uh, and it was really really nice. Uh, so I think uh, we should we can um, give up of some some situations, some actions, but we should have something to um, to to help us to forget. Uh, everything is um, that is um, um, stressing uh, you. Yeah, um, and we have another question. Um, so you mentioned earlier that with your lupus, um, quite often it made it hard to do experimental procedures in the laboratory. I was just wondering, um, how did you manage to overcome that? Did you have to really kind of plan around your symptoms then? Exactly. When I was okay. I, I I was able uh, was able to do the experiments, and when I was with symptoms, I wait a little bit and I did different things: write papers, uh, read papers, and so on. I think that's really good advice, actually. What you what you've just said there, you know, you kind of have to fit your work around your disorder, and it's okay to do that. To you know, to only write papers or something for a couple of months if that's what you need in order to be able to continue the work long term. Yeah. Yeah, that's the beauty of science, because mm -hmm. we can manage our time if our boss allows us, uh, and mm -hmm. this is good. Yeah, exactly. The flexibility is actually yes. quite beneficial for people with disabilities. Um, and then one last question we have. Um, do you think that there is enough awareness and support for carers of a person with a disability in the academic field? Not at all. Not at all. Mm -hmm. I yeah. feel very alone because no one understands this. Only those that also have children with this kind of disabilities and people never talk about this because in academia, we should be machines. We should be always in our best, giving lectures, giving seminars, writing papers, applying for projects. But life is not only that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I must admit, I never hear it spoken about. Um, but I guess it's it's not even just being a, a carer long term. I guess if there's a death in the family, so for example, one of your parents is getting older, I think exactly often that's not um taken into account by the powers that be in academia. And I think that's something we really need to work on. The disability and illness cannot just affect the researcher directly, but also the people around the researcher. And it has a similar, if not greater, effect. So no, it's something we should talk about more in the future, to be yeah, honest. Absolutely. How do you think we should overcome that? As a... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I think I'm awareness sorry. Is a, awareness would be a good start. I awareness. Think, I think awareness yeah. is a good, st a good start, yes, of mm -hmm. course. And it has to come a little bit come down. So, for example, having three or four days per year, which is not holiday and it's not sick leave, it's maybe carer's leave or something like that. Ah, you that's know, a good where, idea. Yeah, it's infrastructure changes that need to be done, really. Yeah. And like we said, awareness. And so just by speaking about it is a good start. Yeah, I agree. Sure. Okay, then, if there's no more questions, then I think it just leaves to say that uh, obviously a massive thank you to you, Maria. That was honestly a very stirring uh, presentation. And like you said, I also feel a bit emotional about it. <laughs> it was really fantastic. And thank you so much for being vulnerable with us. Um, and people who have been watching, if you enjoyed, um, then please feel free to use the feedback form, which is in the chat. I will also quickly put it up on the screen. You can scan the QR code. And um, yeah, that will allow you to go to a feedback form to tell us yeah, what you thought of the webinar. Hey, uh, Katerina, any last words from you? Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, I hope we meet 
more more times. We just I just knew you during the summer. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, we will be in touch from now on, and we hope we can also with uh, this working group at Alva increase visibility for the caregivers um, of people with uh, disabilities, as is your case. Great. Thank you so much about that. Hey, well, thank you very much, everyone. And I hope you have a good rest of the day. And yeah, we will obviously keep you updated on when our next webinar will be. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.